Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of the Origin Delay Masterclass series. We have a wonderful guest today, uh, concert master of Chicago Symphony Orchestra, Robert Chan. He's going to work with a group of students from Michigan State University on orchestral excerpts. It's something I think he can really give a great guidance because he's been playing in the orchestra for over 20 years and he was a member of Philadelphia Orchestra before joining Chicago Symphony and we've known each other for many many years since uh, the early 90s we met at Juilliard School and uh, we were actually sweet mates at the, the dormitory and while we were working with Dorothy Delay so we had many many wonderful memories to share with you and I'm looking forward to this session and uh, please welcome Robert Chan. Start with the Mendelssohn. Um, I, you know, I, I like what you're doing. I think you can uh, be a little, uh, pay a little more attention to uh, the dynamics. Um, what is the dynamic marking at the beginning? It's piano. It's piano. Piano. Yeah. It. I mean. Maybe it has something to do with the uh, um, just how the mic is picking it up, but I think you can play softer. Yeah. Okay. Um, and part of that is that you you know when we when we had, have an orchestra audition, uh, we choose this excerpt uh, to show um, control. To show uh, control of the stroke, and control the dynamic and uh, control of um, a tempo, how steady it can be, yeah? So what is your, uh, so the first thing would be, what is your metronome marking for this? Uh, I think myself, it's uh, around between uh, 80 to 83 or 82. Okay, uh, it's, it, seems, it seems okay, but um, maybe you can try a little bit faster Sure. Yeah. Let's see if we can. Uh, no, it's not. Let's see if we can aim for eighty six. Is it possible to play softer? Yes. <laughs> okay, but 
I like that tempo. It, it's, uh, it's, it actually makes it a little easier because you're sort of doing it in, like in a halfway in between tempo and it's, it's very difficult for the bow to, to, to bounce um, mm -hmm. in the right uh, rhythm. Yeah? And watch, watch your, watch your left hand. Let, let your left hand be the guide. The, the left hand should dictate how fast your bow is going. Forzandos, right? Yes. Um, three in a row. Yeah. And I, I think in, in classical style, when you have uh, accents or swasandis in a row, the implication is that you make a crescendo. Mm -hmm. Okay? So after the three, and then he marks the piano again, so you have to come back to piano. Yeah? So just, just make sure that um, you observe that. Um, I'll try again from the beginning. Okay, Sandy. Sandy, uh, make sure that you you have the pulse going in your in your mind. You know, so that how many how many beats are you gonna give yourself before you start to play? Two. Two, okay. So one, two, one, two. starting again I just want you to really like you know you should play as if you're like you're conducting yourself yeah yeah so that you, you really give yourself one and really give yourself that really give yourself that prep beat. Crescendo, crescendo, yeah? the idea yeah mm -hmm. um, 
When you go to the... Uh, when you go to the lower um, strings, uh, you, don't, you don't have to try to bounce so much. Yeah. You know, just really close to the string and small amount of bow. Actually, uh, before we go on, it, you know, when we listen to an excerpt like the Mendelssohn um, or any other scherzo for that matter, what we're looking for is uh, somebody who will be able to fit into a violin section, you know, and just sort of um, so that, you know, your, your uh, bow stroke is, can be really easily be unified into a group. So that's why I say, you know, little bow and close to the string, because mm -hmm. that helps you not uh, uh, stick out of the texture. Uh, that's the difference between um, uh, playing in, a, in an ensemble, is that you, you have to uh, try to play in a way that uh, makes it easier for your stand partner to uh, play with you it makes it easier for you to play with a larger group of people now. So that's why, you know, when we listen to this excerpt, we're looking for a uh, sort of a stroke, the control of the stroke and the, uh, you know, that it's articulate, but at the same time, it's not um, uh, too uh, virtuoso in the sense, in the, in, the, in the regular sense, you know? Mm. Yeah, even though it, it, it takes a lot of, uh, it takes a lot of technique to play small and contained that way. Okay, okay, now uh, Strauss, what do, you, what do you think of the character of this um, excerpt? Uh, heroic and fearless. Fearless, heroic, yeah, and um, so how do you want to uh, express that? It's like a fearless. <laughs> okay, like uh, technically, what would you do to to express that? Technically, uh, I try not to uh, lift my finger too much. So you know, uh, control so it react faster. Uh huh. Mm. And I I think I try not to press my bow too much and use maybe uh not too much bow so it doesn't sound uh, uh not precise and. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um. It's funny because I'm actually thinking of the opposite. <laughs> um, when we listen to this excerpt, the reason why we choose this excerpt is really to see if the person, uh, the candidate is able to um, play the instrument. And you, obviously, you can obviously play your instrument, but you were a little contained, like, like in the Mendelssohn, you know, it's a, a little contained. And this is like it should just um, it should go, you know, because it, the character of Don Giovanni or Don Juan is this sort of swashbuckling character, you know. It's, it's got lots of uh, vigor and he's got lots of uh, charm and and um, 
panache and I don't know what other words you can use, but generally lots of lots of personality, right? Mm. Right. So I you know, I, I would use You know, lots of bow, lots of bow, and and quick, quick bow speed, and you know, big gestures. I think. Okay. Um, can you try uh, just a little bit from the beginning? gesture good okay now um, have you played this piece in an orchestra before yes okay so when the conductor comes out um, there is there any preparation to the beginning no, not really. Not really, right? So it has to, it has to feel like really, you know, um, this, like you're, uh, it's like you're you're shooting an arrow, and you stretch it, you stretch the bow to its uh, maximum tightness, and at the last minute you let go of the arrow. And that's what it should feel like. Yeah? Yeah, let's try it again, try it again. When you cross a string, don't lose your sound. Play this theme. It's it's just. to think in underneath you know when you play this theme that the da, 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 yeah. there's that triplet figure underneath yeah that that should you know keeps your energy driving forward uh, <laughs> Sure that you sustain lot of yeah.
make sure that you have really a lot of shape to that. Yeah. Stay on the string. Don't come off the string. crescendo right and these yeah. those really start from the string um sometimes you're you don't have proper contact before you start yeah okay um good really good um you know this this figure <laughs> try playing um with a lot of hair not too much uh that's it that's it good good no uh, there's the uh, there's the flosando right uh The top note is the, the one with the accent. Yes. Yeah? So you really have to show us that. Good. Good. Excellent. That's the idea. Yeah? Yeah. Very good. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Robert. Wonderful demonstration, actually, too. It's, uh, it's great to hear you play <laughs> some of the or orchestra excerpts, you know, by heart. Right. You, can, you can play them in the middle of the night. Somebody wakes you up, you can, oh, you yeah. can play. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps, you know, many people who are uh, uh, watching our webinar, they would like to know, are there any advices you can address to young players who are preparing for orchestra auditions? Are there any, any, any specific things you think can help them to prepare better and to stand out of the crowd of many, many advanced players who are auditioning from your experience? Okay, um, you know, there are... Um, when you prepare for an audition, it's really... You should treat it like you're uh you know preparing yourself for an international competition or you know um 
or if you're giving a recital, um, you should treat, even though the excerpts are often short, you know, two, three minutes, um, I think you have to treat it as if you're presenting it like you're in a recital, you know, present it like music. I think that's the most important thing for, um, for people who are listening is that they want to, they want to feel like you're uh, making music. They want to get an idea of what you are like as a musician. Um, of course, the, there are the main, uh, there are some very basic things that you have to address when you uh, go to an orchestra audition. One is that you, you know, you play the right notes, you play the right rhythms, uh, you choose uh, the correct tempi, um, and you, you know, play the right articulations. You know, those are, but those are very basic things. Um, but I think for me, the most important thing is that you, um, you have to, sh you have to show that, uh, like you're, like you're a clockmaker or, a, you know, I like, you know, a, a somebody who, uh, makes diamonds, you know, you, you take this thing and you really refine and you file it down to it's, you know, per everything's perfect, um, musically, technically, um, and you know, that, that takes actually a great deal of commitment. <laughs> um, so I think that's, that's the thing that I have to um, offer as, as far as advice when you go to an uh, audition, you learn your music. You really, you really learn your music, learn all of it. Don't, uh, don't make any assumptions like, oh, they're not really, gonna, they're not gonna hear that or they're not gonna, learn everything that's on that list uh, prepare properly, uh, prepare with the right tempi, uh, articulation, dynamics, uh, you know, uh, rhythm, and show your musicianship. Show your musicianship. You know, show show that you're a you're a musician. You're a, you're playing this like a piece of music, not not like uh, you're typewriter <laughs> yeah it's important that you say because many students uh, sometimes get preoccupied with the uh, you know trying to be perfect and trying to you know not just to make any mistakes of course it's important but it's not the the ultimate goal no like I you're mean, saying it, it's important that they really get to the core of the music and they try to interpret this to the to the best uh, to the best ability they can and with the best I think with the best character and their Absolutely. personality because you're looking for somebody you don't want to have a robot playing the violin in the right in the orchestra exactly. you want to have somebody who has a personality and it's going to make the chicago symphony orchestra sound even more alive and more absolutely more enchanting yeah, yeah absolutely yeah that's a, that's a very good point you know just make sure that you are you know treating it like it's music um because that's that's what it's about and it's a great music I sometimes I feel envy to you and to some of my friends and colleagues who spent a wonderful time playing the orchestra I, I've, I've done just a little when I was a teenager when I was at school and now I feel that uh, there's a, such a incredible repertoire you have a, this privilege and joy of really playing those symphonies it's it's the best music ever written it it really is you know I it, I often get um, sort of emotional, you know, when I'm playing in the orchestra, because uh, you know, I, I, there's the music is so great, and there's so much of it. <laughs> you yeah. know, he, he wrote four symphonies. Uh, Brahms wrote four symphonies. Beethoven wrote nine symphonies. You know, Shostakovich fifteen. You know, uh, and. Mozart, uh, Haydn, 104 symphonies, Mozart, you know, 41 symphonies. It, there's the, the source of music is, is endless. And I think that also the, the, the joy of um, being in a, in a group and hearing all these 
other sounds that you're a part of, that you're contributing to. I mean, that's um, that can be a little, a little overwhelming sometimes. You know, it's it's very different than you know uh, practicing your concerto. You know, and preparing to go and play somewhere. Um, when, when you play in an orchestra, you're constantly um, in contact with other musicians and and you're always playing um, looking for a way to play in like in uh, an, in concert or in an ensemble with other musicians and that, that's that's to me is um, a big part of music making um, is that it's not just a, a private uh, a private act but uh, it's meant to be uh, shared you know a, a lot of a lot of it is meant to be shared some some music is a very private uh, meditation but a lot of this music a lot of music that's out there is meant to be made together with somebody else and I'm sure it uh, really somehow changed your interpretation on some of the concertos you've been playing as an orchestra member and then as a soloist because I remember oh. when I played once uh, Brahms uh, concerto in the orchestra. I mean, I realized it's, it's, it's very different music, oh, yeah. which I, at that time I wasn't even aware of some of the nuances from the orchestra. I'm sure for you, it's a, it's every time you play it from the, within the orchestra and then you play as a soloist, it makes a very different experience. You know, for many years, I, as a youngster, I thought, oh, you know, you play a concerto and you just have to prepare it really well and it has to sound you know brilliant and glorious and 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 the, the as i got older you know I, I more and more i realized that um when you play with like you play a concerto and with an orchestra it's so important to to engage in uh, a dialogue you know with whoever you're playing with in the orchestra because you know yes the violin is a is a beautiful so, you know solo instrument but without all the other things around it it you know it can be a a little dull <laughs> you know it's not it's not it can be not so interesting but with all the other things you know all the harmony all the uh, uh, texture and the sound that's involved in the orchestra um, it it makes the it makes the music so much more interesting um, and you know I, I've had this I've had one of the privileges that I have as concertmaster of the Chicago Symphony is I, I get to play a concerto with my colleagues uh, you know once a year and it you know it's something that I dreamt about as as a young person you know, oh wow what it would you know it would be like what it would be like to play with the chicago symphony and i'm lucky enough that i get to do it like once a year and and it's 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 overwhelming um it, it's it's a great um it's a great feeling when you play with an orchestra that you know you can really um engage in these kinds of give and take um yeah it's it's it, it changes your perspective on uh, what your role is in terms of, you know, when you're playing a concerto. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So we'll talk a little bit more. I have uh, several questions and perhaps some of our attendees uh, later on can also uh, participate in, uh, in the question and answer discussion. So next performer is Rulin Chen. She's a student of my colleague Yvonne Lam here at Michigan State University. She's going to play only one excerpt, uh, uh, Brahms uh, solo.
Okay, good. Um, so, as context um, for yourself, um, do you know like who you're playing with this tune? Uh, I thought it was flute. Was flute? Oh. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, uh, maybe I forgot. <laughs> Let me double check. Yeah, you should you should look it up in the score. It's the horn. Oh, okay. Horn and oboe. Okay. Okay. So it's basically you're playing the same melody with two other colleagues. Mm -hmm. Right? And so the question is, do you think this is a violin solo? Or do you think it's a horn solo? Or do you think it's a oboe solo? Um, I think it's more like a chamber music, like. I think it's a violin solo. Really? Okay. <laughs> um, and so, if it's a violin solo, you know, what? Um, how do you want to make it so that it's like? What is the characteristic of this solo? A little bit passionate, but just a little bit. <laughs> um, I think you know. I, I, do you have a? Um, can, maybe you can give yourself an image of like what you see when you play uh, the solo. Uh, on the top of the mountain. Yeah, yeah, on the top, and you can see. How far can you see? Mm. <laughs> Pretty far. Like endless, like you can see it to the horizon, you know, mm -hmm. space, really spacious. Uh, and so you have to give the impression of a lot of, a lot of space. Yeah. And how do you give that impression? Um. Use much uh, more bow. Good idea. Can you try it again and just have that um, image in your in your mind? Much better. You feel the difference? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What? What's different? Uh, use. Uh, I use fast bow speed. Okay. Besides the mechanical, you feel uh, freer. Yes. Okay. That's the feeling that you should have. It's just the space, freedom. Um, if you were, um, there was once a conductor who said, "There, if you're an animal, if you think of yourself as an animal, what kind of animal would you be for this music? This kind of music, oh, uh, a huge bird, kind of. Exactly, like an eagle, you know? Okay. Eagles, they, they fly up in the air so high and they can see all around them and there's a there's a freedom you know they're, that, that they're up in the air and they feel this wind against you know you feel like you're you're flying you should always feel like this playing the solo that you're you're flying you know there's that flying kind of um sensation uh,
Yeah. So um, always have. Good contact with the string, and you know, sort of this. When you're talking about freedom and you're talking about space, you're also talking about this sort of <coughs> endless wave of sound that you have to sustain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's about sustain and using a lot of bow at the same time. So you can't go. Try again, try, just try again. Good, good. Now, can you connect your vibrato? Don't let the vibrato stop. Yeah. Yeah, the, the tendency for everybody is that you'd go down bow and at the end of the bow, you always make a diminuendo. You have to fight against that. Yeah. All right. That's it. And really sustain. I hear like note, note, note. That's it. Has to feel, you know, I, I think you have to feel it has to feel really generous. Mm. It has to feel like you're inviting people to your sound. Yeah. So that you're not you're not playing over here and they're over there. Yeah, go to them. Once there was a colleague who said, you have to play like you love every note. <laughs> every note, si, la, so, so that's la, so, fa, la, so, fa, mi, re. Like you, you don't want to let go. Mm -hmm. you're, you're hugging every note, yeah, okay? Here, ti ta ta, ti ta ta. It's a it's a syncopation, right? Mm -hmm. Don't let it go too easy. Yeah, 
just so that there's you feel like you're stretch stretching yeah Try a different fring. I would stay loud longer in a lower position. Are you start with first position? Start in second position. Oh. To feel like, you know, have you ever made noodles before? No. <laughs> or any kind of bread? Okay, yeah. Yeah. So that, you know, once you have the dough, uh -huh. as, you know, th there's, it, you know, when you pull on it, there's resistance, you know? It, it has to feel that way. Like the down bow and the up bow have to have the. So it has the same resistance. Yeah. Okay, and when you go faster. Has to have the same, you know, friction uh, on the bow. It can't be too too um, too loose. Has has to feel like there's um, uh, resistance, like grip. Sustain every note going down this scale. Mi, re, do, si, la. Every note, yeah? Love, hold, hug, whatever word you want to use. Uh, whatever uh, word you want to use to remind yourself to... Maybe you can Don't make too much diminuendo. Keep the keep the sound. It's like you're singing, you know. If you sing, you have to support support your yeah. Once again. That's it. 
Go on. Don't lose the sound too much. It's still a violin solo. So if you go to piano, it's a solo piano. Yeah. Hold the sound. Hold, hold the sound. Make sure that you sometimes um, if you broaden a little bit the, the note mm -hmm. um, it'll give you more energy one two da -di -da. It's too slow to me. Okay. And then you can slow down a little bit, but when you start. Start up or what happens? Okay, mm -hmm. good. Um, you want to try and play this one more time? Oh, sure. Yeah, just from the beginning. Just think of space. Think of all the things that we were talking about. Sound, uh, resistance, um, anything to draw the maximum uh, attention to the violin line.
right. Very good. Um, one last thing I want you to think about is um, when you cross the strings, um, that you don't lose the sound. Yeah. Yeah. It, often you cross, like when you're crossing from E to A string or A to D string, you lose the energy in the sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Try to sustain that, keep the energy in the sound when you cross over. Yeah, so okay. you, yeah, you prepared. energy through this through the sound yeah and another thing to think about is your use of vibrato yeah yeah uh it doesn't always have to be the same speed and it doesn't have to be always the same um uh, uh, width you know mm -hmm. about how the bow can help you make the vibrato maybe slower and wider you know so that it's not always you know this narrow but sometimes it can be this wide mm -hmm. because when you sometimes when you have a wider vibrato you actually bring more energy to the sound yeah and that's what and that's what you want to do is you want to bring energy to this uh, solo not like fast or you know loud but just So that there has to be that s sense of like big, broad. Try, try it. thing you can think about is um, when you vibrate think of the your anchor as your elbow mm -hmm. yeah try try that just think of the elbow heavy okay. you feel a difference light what happens is that your fingers are like on top of the string yeah but if your elbow is heavy the finger actually really sits in the string mm. that'll give you a, a sort of a richer fuller vibrato okay mm -hmm. uh, experiment with it a little bit yeah okay mm -hmm. good excellent thank you so much thank you Thank you, Robert. Beautiful demonstrations. Beautiful sound you make even through the zoom. We can hear <laughs> the variety. It's the of expensive violin. <laughs> but I like Yasha Hek, it said, you know, it doesn't play by itself. <laughs> it doesn't make any sound. No. I'm sure you can make any violin sound as beautiful. I remember you playing different instruments actually when we were. At Juilliard, you had one instrument, and then we played some chamber music on many different occasions. You have different instruments, so right, that's yeah. good sound. <laughs> yeah. Listen, you, do you know that um, 
I initiated this concert series to commemorate uh, Miss Delay because she was a graduate of Michigan State University in 1937. Wow. And it's wonderful to have you and many, many other guests, her former students, joining us uh -huh. in, uh, in this wonderful uh, way to, I think, to bring the memories of many, many of her former students. And I'm sure you have something you can share with us from the time you met Miss Delay. It was late 80s. When did you meet her? Yeah, it was 1987. I think the first time I I met her was uh, in uh, at the Aspen Music Festival. I went there as a student. Um, uh, in my it was right before my senior year in high school. Um, I had been studying in Los Angeles, and um, my actually my sister's piano teacher uh, recommended that I go um, and spend the summer with Miss Delay, and. Uh, you know, I, I had come from a very um, sort of uh, um, sort of regimented, organized uh, way of studying, um, you know, where the, the teacher gave you, uh, you know, a set of fingerings, a set of bowings, and, you know, you would just, you would, you would do those and you go to the lesson and they would say, Okay, do this, this, do it like this, do it like this, like this. And the thing that I found really fascinating with Miss Delay, or, and also a little confusing at first because I was young and I, you know, I was really not used to this way of like having to sort of think for, your, think for yourself and come up with your own solutions. And, you know, looking back on that, I, 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 I really appreciated the fact that um, she didn't give, you know, any kind of set fingerings or set bowings, you know. It, she adapted whatever she was um, dealing with, you know, adapt, adapted to wh whichever student was standing in front of her. Uh, and she would come up with solutions that were, uh, that worked for that student. But, you know, she, she didn't have one solution that worked for everybody. And... I really appreciated that um, years later, you know, because um, I'm <clears throat> it, it forced actually forced me to think about things in a very different way, uh, and to and it forced me to actually have to be my own teacher. I think that's really her um, was really her great strength in. Um, dealing with uh, her students is that she gave them, um, gave us the tools to uh, think for ourselves and to come up with our own solutions. I, I'm not sure if you had the same uh, experience with her. But yeah, many, many guests share very similar thoughts. Loma Means uh, was uh, also elaborating on the same kind of experience and Jimmy Lin and uh, and Kathy Cho was recently also a guest and she actually mentioned that uh, you and Kathy were one of the first ones who started teaching at Juilliard and you were assisting me delay assistant. Right. Yeah. so I mean perhaps you 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 also had some advices on on teaching not only on on on, on playing but on the teaching maybe uh -huh. you can share something there as well um I, you know, I have to say that I, I always enjoy teaching uh, because it actually helps me, um, helps me think of why and how I'm doing something and, and to try to explain that to another person, but actually to not tell them what it is that I am doing, but just to show them like this is what you're doing and maybe you can um, maybe you can try it like this or you can try it like that um, so that they go home and hopefully that they're they continue to think about what it is that do they do and I always find that it helps my own playing to teach because um, you know you, you you see the you you see the problem 
existing in, in somebody else and you think, oh, that's very obvious, right? And, <laughs> and then you think, well, gee, I have the same problem and why don't I do what I'm telling this person? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I catch myself sometimes doing the yeah. same thing. Yeah. And, uh, and, and also sometimes you try to explain something and, and then uh, it happens to me lately. I, I think that I'm very precise in giving the details and then I try to demonstrate and then I realize that I do something completely different. Right, yeah. <laughs> and, and I think that's a, that's, that's a beautiful thing about teaching is that um, if you approach it in a way that uh, you, um, you listen, you listen to the student and you, um, you, I mean, you really listen to the student and you, you really try to think of a, um, you really try to think of what, what it is that they, they need, uh, individually, not so much, uh, what you think they should have, but actually what they need, really actually what they need. Uh, some students, uh, what they need is somebody just to say, you know, you can do it. And you give them the permission to do it because often it's just, it's, it's doubt. You know, it's like you, you doubt what you're able to do. And somebody, it's good to have somebody there say, go ahead, do it like that. You know, it's perfect. I wouldn't change a thing. Oh, or, and, and I think it's a very powerful thing is when you are able to um, tap into somebody's mind and um, make them see what they're capable of. Um, and it, I, you know, it doesn't always happen, but I, I always find it very satisfying when, uh, when you see that the, the look of recognition in the student's eyes, like, oh, oh yeah, like that. Oh, or you you see that they they do it and they hear it and they're like oh that you know something very um, like wow that's that's really a very simple concept. Yeah. Tell me something. Yeah, with all your playing, you know, for many many years, you come you have a certain routine for coming to the orchestra rehearsals. Do you develop, did you develop some uh, approach for yourself to be in a good shape, to warm up, to be very efficient? Do you have something you can share? And, and what actually, how has it changed? How has it evolved from your 20s to these days? Oh, geez. You know, I used to, I used to practice uh, sort of blindly. Um, and, you know, I, I thought that if I put in many, many hours um, that, uh, you know, something would, uh, something would develop and happen and become good. Well, it, it's not always the case. Uh, yes, you have to put in certain amount of time, but I always, I, I, you know, I, it's like, I remember this now, when you do it, many, many times in a row, but you're not actually thinking about it. And if you're doing it incorrectly, then you will always play it incorrectly. You're learning the mistakes you're yeah, doing. You're, you're, just, <laughs> you're studying the mistakes. The state mistakes become part of you. And so, you know, I, 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 I try to be um, more, uh, you know, just take the time to, to, to learn a piece of music and to just not to try to learn it so quickly, but you know, I, I take a little bit at a time and I, I try to <coughs> digest what it is that I need to digest. And that doesn't always uh, work so well, you know, when you're playing in an orchestra, because especially the orchestra like Chicago, where it's a different program every week. Sometimes you have three different programs every week. Um, you know, you can't do that. But I think for a gen just general maintenance of your own sanity and your own mental health, it's very important <laughs> to, 
practice slowly, uh, practice carefully, and practice listening. Listen, really listening to yourself when you're playing, and so that you realize, like, what you're doing. You know, like uh, something that's rhythmic, uh, and you're, you know, you you play it fast, and you don't you don't really think about how it sounds. But if you slow it down, you realize, oh, I'm I'm speeding up or I'm you know slowing down. Is there a particular repertoire you try to keep in your hands and just to go over in solo repertoire or orchestral repertoire? I the the repertoire that I um, always go back to. <laughs> I mean, this this will sound uh, uh, funny to a lot of people, I'm sure, but I I always go back to Kreutzer. Uh, because they address each one of them addresses a very specific uh, technique it targets a specific technique whether it's in the right hand or the left hand and uh, if you take the time to do them slowly and to do really to really do them properly um, they help uh, sort of maintain your playing um, for the long term uh, and as far as music goes I, what I try to keep in my sort of my daily um, routine is um, some Bach and some Paganini. Uh, I just started again uh, recently to uh, study the 24 Caprices. Um, and some of them I learned well when I was young. And most of them I didn't learn so well when I was young. Uh, and I always had this phobia, you know, this fear of uh, playing them because, you know, I, I had this idea that they they had to be a certain way, you know. And but now that I am older, I, I I go back to them and I have a little more patience. And and there are things that I understand about my body that uh, uh, make it make things. Um, more logical so that I'm not just uh, you know like a blind person in the room with the lights turned off trying trying to find things but it's like okay I, I understand this pattern and this is how it fits on the violin and it all becomes very logical in, in Paganini even though it's not easy but a lot of the a lot of what he's written is very this is very logical it makes sense with the hands. I mean, you have to find a way to do it. But once you find a way to do it, it's 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 uh, you know, it's not it's not so uh, scary. Impossible. <laughs> yeah, scary. <laughs> yeah, I, I I absolutely agree with you, and uh, it's interesting because during the the epic time, uh, I also somehow started even learning some of the caprices I haven't played, and I found that such an inspiration actually in uh, slowly going through and some of my students actually join me in this uh, challenge also and I, I I keep this as uh, my daily routine different caprices but what I was not really much uh, aware when I was young I've always preparing caprices to perform right yeah but right now I, I find it very from the very different perspective I I, I, I practice them to study to to get myself into the the core of the all different kind of techniques right it really de develops warms up and it you know it makes the brain and coordination work in a very very challenging but very different way so right. we're able to make music out of this and to go beyond uh, beyond your own expectation that it means right. some of the things they practically are impossible to play when you start working and right. eventually if you find a different angle and for me some of the caprices which are rarely performed like number six number seven i, I don't hear well, them. They... <laughs> no they're, they're just incredible amazing and uh, every day i play them i find a different angle and there's so many different dimensions you can Absolutely. approach this thing and yeah yeah, yeah. exactly and so in endless endless uh, uh possibility so it's very very i mean he was genius not just because he was uh and ahead of his time but he left our for us this uh this manuscript of uh it's just uh 
just uh, something one can go, go through and become a better better player better better violinist and eventually better musician because you have a capacity to develop things in a very different violinistic way right and so i'm glad know, you I mentioned this and of course bach every uh, so, so many other uh, guests uh, on this webinar they mentioned that bach is, is essential yeah it's it's uh it's sort of uh, nourishing you know it's like taking your vitamins or something i can't i can't really explain it but it's it just cleans your mind. You have to lose yourself, and you yeah. can, yeah. you know, fly in in the in, in the cosmos, in the absolute. That's when right. you yeah. when you're able to play, it. first you have to be able to play it. But then it will take you like a, a wind and can uplift your spirit. And absolutely, you can learn something from the experience. At least yeah. uh, it's yeah. always something very magical happens when you perform Bach. Yeah, and so we'll. Ha I'm sure. I'm sure. We'll, I hope we'll have time after we hear one more player okay she's been already i think getting anxious and uh Ipe lean she's she's going to play actually several excerpts perhaps we won't have time for everything but no you can, uh you can d discuss and figure out which ones she okay. prepares six excerpts for you oh wow okay great in this excerpt or should I keep playing um well let's talk about this one a little bit um I, I think this one is always uh people are a little afraid of the <laughs> just that uh, those two octave span and mm. Don't be afraid of using the bow, you know, draping it over three strings, yeah? Okay, and one other thing that I um, want to just encourage you to do, uh, I, the tempo is very good. Uh, is to... Um, find more expression in the sound and i think that loosely translates into uh, vibrate you know like vibrate on um, especially on the beginning of each slur i think if you vibrate the first note of each slur it's easier to vibrate the other notes okay so try again
it so uh You know, those appoggiatoras lean on them and vibrate on them so that you th there's an expression on the... That's it. That's 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 the idea. Is that it has to be really expressive, um, and I you know I would say the piano is a is a is not a volume indication. Um, the espressivo is what you're looking for. Yeah. Um, the, the marking is what piano dolce. Yes. Yeah. The dolce is what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Dolce espressivo, yeah, N not so much soft, but expressive, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, what's next? Brahms Symphony Number no. Four, first movement. Okay. for is a certain sound, okay? Um, and what do you think that sound is? Uh, I will say much more deeper, warmer sound in general. Oh. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so it's, it's, so you have to, it's like you're wearing a, a, a nice cashmere sweater, something, yeah? Soft, warm, you know, thick. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, how do you want to make that for yourself? Sustain the bow more, 
and vibrate brother mm -hmm. which vibrate sound uh-huh good so let's try that and try to uh, try not to break up the gestures no, so it's always a descending third and an ascending sixth. Is that no half note make it more expressive not too short yeah okay a little longer good um, and I would think of the uh, rest not not so long okay yeah so it's like a it's like breathing okay um, so have that idea in your mind okay now go on from where you left off You know, you're you're in dialogue with whom? Yeah. So it helps if you if you know that you're. I I, I know the melody, but I can. Uh, I I forgot which instrument. Okay, it doesn't really matter which instrument. You just it's like you you have it's like uh, you're passing something to someone. Yeah. Um, don't drop it before you reach them. <laughs> Okay, try it again. Yeah, that's it. It's really sustained.
Good. Um, can you use, uh, generally very good, uh, can you use more both? <laughs> Really broad detache. Yeah? Continue the phrase. And The last notes you have to make a crescendo because you're you're passing it to somebody else, yeah? And make sure that you in make sure you're, th you're singing in your mind the second violin at you and then you you have to take it from them. So rhythmically, it has to be correct. I think you were late. Okay. Yeah? Okay. And then, uh, can you do... So articulate every note. So that you don't make a, a the, you know, this little hairpin. It doesn't say to make a hairpin, right? Right. Good. Um, what else do you have? Uh, I have Mozart's 39. And what else? No. Okay, just, uh, let's listen to the 39. It's a first movement. And I have also last movement, so this two. Oh, uh, let's do last movement. Okay. Generally excellent. Um, do you have a diminuendo before us, the subito piano, the fourth subito forte? Oh, where's that? I don't have diminuendo. Okay, I want you to make more of a diminuendo. Let the forte really stands out. And once you start the forte, try to keep it forte. You know, you play the first note forte, and then you go back to piano. Yeah, the the contrast is the uh, you know that part of Mozart that is very um, it's dramatic. Uh, I like the way that you started. You know, it's because it's a lot of people have trouble starting this excerpt. Um, Yeah, 
so that it's real real contrast between the forte and the piano okay so in general the forte part you play mostly on string uh, yeah on, okay. or on the string yeah That you can make more difference in the in the forte sound and the piano piano sound. Uh, maybe it's just a, a, a zoom thing, but I, I think it's uh, the the sound can be much uh, much more different in the, in the different dynamics. Like. Uh, <laughs> In the string, yeah. Can you try it? Try this again. Good. 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 Um, when you go forte, I, I have a. a a thought for you that maybe you will help. Um, instead of having your bow hair sort of tilted, try to use your little flatter hair. Try it, just forte. That's it. Yeah, that's it. That, that's yeah that's the difference in the in the in the sound okay all right good very good good job thank you thank you Yipei. thank you robert wonderful session very productive engaging lots of results uh, everyone could hear on the spot everyone is making adjustments and uh, to your great uh, guidance Thank you again for being with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. And before we let you go, I just wanted to ask you, and there actually there, there are some questions from attendees as well, and it's something I will always very interested to learn. What uh, makes uh, a great conductor impression, especially if you see somebody for the first time when you, when somebody comes to the podium and um, from your experience, if especially with someone less known, not exactly yet uh, uh, one of the most uh, you know accomplished conductors, mm -hmm. and also second part of the question: Who are your favorite conductors? You work as a soloist, as a concertmaster. I'm sure you can share some of the uh, names like Muti and uh, and Barimboim and perhaps somebody else, and and why? Right. Um, you know, I think. With, with a great conductor, uh, when they come to the orchestra, one thing that you notice about them is, um, one, they're very efficient with uh, their rehearsal time. Two, they don't say a whole lot. They don't really need to tell, give you too many directions because they're able to show with their hands what they want. And three, they're very knowledgeable. They have really studied the music and they, un they understand how the music is put together uh, in um, structurally, in instrumentation, in 
uh, and you know, and all the dynamics and the, and the voicing and the so on and so forth. They have a great understanding of how something should sound and where each thing fits in that uh, that sound. I think that's that's a uh, that's been my experience with the with the mark of a great conductor is that they don't say a whole lot, but through their uh, physical gesture and their sheer um, uh, intelligence and their intellect, they're able to show what how the music is put together and the, uh, and they have a, a personality that the orchestra will just sort of uh, engage immediately and follow and, and know exactly what it is that they want. Um, and, you know, I, I've worked with a number of uh, conductors who are um, who are that way, and uh, you know, it's and the, the really smart ones. <laughs> and I have to say, the really smart conductors are the ones that allow the orchestra to play uh, and allow the orchestra to correct itself, because um, often, you know, conductors. Uh, they 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 work with an orchestra that's not maybe not as great as the Chicago Symphony, and they feel like they have to tell them what to do, tell them you know, and, and if it's not doesn't sound a certain way, they have to correct it. Well, the really smart ones know that if you play it again, something will change. The correct musicians understand, okay, we need to make these these sort of small changes, and you know it gets better without you having to actually spend so much time talking about what it is that's not working. Um, and I, I, I think that's, uh, it's, it's very valuable. Also, also, also for teachers, you know, <laughs> is, is uh, that you let the, let the student play because sometimes they understand that, uh, what they need to do and they'll do it again and it'll get better. Um, and they'll make you look like a genius without you having to say anything. <laughs> uh, I remember when we met uh, in early nineties. Actually, it would be I think interesting to share that we were even sweet sweet mates <laughs> at the new dormitory. We just moved in in a brand new uh, That's story, right. story story tall brand new building right at the Lincoln Center was like yeah. piece of the uh, art yeah. architecture and uh, in, in the heart of Manhattan next to the Juilliard and we were sharing the the same uh, suite. That's right. It was it was uh, quite a time and I remember when I came from back from from Russia from Soviet time Soviet Union at the time and um, I didn't speak much English and I, I remember I asked you to help me with some of my English assignments and you took it very seriously. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> and that it shows your, your, your personality. You, you, you're always very, you know, to the, to the core of the, of the problem. And with the, I think with the violin playing, it also shows that you're very detailed and very thoughtful. But uh, what I remember, I, I was really at that time fascinated by the fact that you were taking some lessons with Yasha Heifetz. You were, you, oh you, yeah, that's right, yeah. Maybe you can share a little bit with us. Um, I had the, when I was growing up in Los Angeles, uh, I had the opportunity to work with Yasha Heifetz. Um, this is after he had retired from teaching, um, but I, he, I, he must have been uh, a little bit, maybe he felt a little lonely or a little bored at home. <laughs> and he, he wanted to have some company and he wanted some young violinists to come and play for him. So he, he put out this, um, put out word that he wanted to start a, a new class. And uh, so I went to audition for him. Um, you know, it was like a little bit like meeting God. <laughs> uh, because you know, you, you, I grew up sort of idolizing his uh, uh, violin playing, his, his uh, recordings, and and um, it always it there was always a feeling of electricity to his playing, and uh, so, such 
uh, commitment and involvement in everything that he was doing, um, whether it, you know, it was the smallest piece or you know, the great violin concertos, um, always with the deepest, uh, most electrifying, um, electrifying violin playing. And so, you know, to, to, to go to this man and to meet him and to play for him was um, a little intimidating. <laughs> uh, and yeah, we, we, uh, the, there was a group of us, I think there were four of us, four of us in this class. And uh, each time we, each week we would go and, you know, we would play and, um, and he would, uh, everybody would play and it was like master class type would thing. you come to his house yes we went to his house up in the hollywood hills um and uh you know i didn't i didn't drive at the time so you know i had to be driven there by my uh, parents how old were you at that time i was 16 and uh yeah it was it was quite the experience you know it's it's when you walked into his uh, his little studio in the back of his house, it, it felt like you were walking into another, uh, another time in history. Because uh, you, you saw the pictures of Rachmaninoff, our uh, Gabrilovich, uh, you know, Zimbalist, Chrysler, you know, you saw these pictures of these you know, musicians on the wall. And, you know, usually when people have these pictures up on their wall, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I, I found this autograph and it, isn't it nice? But you realize that these photographs on his wall were actually people that he knew and people that he um, uh, either studied with or, uh, you know, had a, had a deep, deeply personal relationship with. And you go and you sit down and, and you start to play and he's just sitting there and he had this little, he had this little uh, baton, you know, that he would use. And when he wanted you to stop, he would tap on his desk. <laughs> and um, I remember, you know, I, from when I auditioned, I, I, I prepared a whole a bunch of things for him. Um, some Bach, some Prokofiev, some um, Mozart, uh, a little... Tchaikovsky, this, that, and, you know, he stopped me, you know, he said, can you play a little bit of the Prokofiev? And I started to play, um, I think it was a D major violin, uh, his D major violin sonata. And after about five measures, he stopped me. I said, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, I found out that he didn't particularly like that piece. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I didn't know. And, um, and then he said, oh, can you play some of the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto for me? Said, I, but Maestro, I didn't prepare it. It's like, play it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, I, you know, I played, you know, I played a little bit. It's like, oh, okay. And he stops me and says, oh, now play this something else. So I said, I, but I didn't, okay, I, I'll, I'll try and do my best. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that was his, I think, I think it was his way of testing these, uh, people who came to play for him. Um, but he didn't ask you to play scales? Oh, he asked me to play scales. But <laughs> no, it was, he, oh, it was, like, it was some, some strange key, right? And <laughs> strange key in, in, in finger octaves or tens, but not starting on the tonic. You know, you had to start on the subdominant, but you had to, <laughs> you had to somehow end your way back up you know, to tonic. It was really confusing. I didn't really understand what he was saying, but you know, it was, it was, it was not a test to see like how, how quick you are and how flexible you are. And you know, he, he it was very obvious to him, um, those who were able to do it or unable to do it. Um, and to, and, and then he sat me down and after I played and we had a conversation. He asked me what kind of violin I played on and what kind of bow I used. And, and then he said, um, you know, he said something to the effect that, um, you know, 
if you are accepted to this class, there's a door in and there's the door out. Meaning, you know, you have to do things my way. You have to follow my um, instructions, basically. And there are certain things that you have to observe, cer certain etiquette, you know, like you always, you came to the lesson, you dress, always dress properly, you know, you never wore like jeans or tennis shoes, or, you know, you wore a nice shirt, you wore a tie or a jacket. <laughs> and I remember I wasn't very comfortable in my jacket, you know, so I would always do, you know, this to try to get a little <laughs> more space. And he said, what, what are you doing? You know, what are you? <laughs> I said, I'm just trying, I'm, I said, don't do that, just play. He <laughs> <laughs> um, was a cur curious guy, and um, I, I played a Sibelius concerto for, for the class one time, and he, uh, he said, okay, so you have this memorized? I said, yes. Uh, okay, so he took the music away, and I started to play, and then and he stopped me and he said, okay, so who has this here? Who has this line? Who are you playing with? Is there a diminuendo here? You know, what the dynamic, what is the dynamic here? Um, and I, those are questions that I really didn't have answers to. And so after a few questions, he said, well, you don't have it memorized. So he gave me <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, those were things that really stuck with me, uh, you know, more than any anything else. Uh, just like if you're going to if you're going to study a piece of music, and you have to really study it, you have to really uh, know it. You, it can't just be because you heard it a certain way. You know, it's like okay, it's this way it's written in the music. It's about integrity, I think, for him. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing this. I mean, the, when you mentioned coming to his house and to seeing these pictures from different era, it reminded me, and I, I think I took it for granted too, I was growing up in St. Petersburg, so I would go to St. Petersburg Conservatory. Uh -huh. and of course, it's a legendary place where Auer was teaching and when Heifetz and Milstein, symbolists, all those people, the great, uh, great school of all those his students were studying and so i would go through the beautiful stairways and there's a marble wall with the names of some of the graduates very famous right, yeah, right. <laughs> students and then i would actually come to the room where our was teaching uh-huh so i would have some of the lessons with a, a wonderful violinist and professor who was uh, creating me and preparing me for some of the important events at that time when i was still at school but Occasionally taking lessons with Boris Gudnikov, he's a wonderful violinist. Yes. Winner of uh, Tchaikovsky competition in 1962. So he was teaching at that room where our was teaching. Ah. So to come to this room and to feel the vibes, you know, it was still <laughs> like there's still some some phantoms of those great. That's right. You feel the, you feel their spirit. You feel their ghost somehow. Yeah. And, I and it feel great, you know. You can b believe it in this or not, but it was very special experience playing in that room. I'm sure it was. Yeah, yeah. Sure it was. So I, I can understand what uh, what was incredible uh, in, in experience for you to meet Heifetz and when you were six oh. years old and to spend some time. I think it was you mentioned that you know sometimes it's just just an encouragement from someone that you can do it already makes a, a, a huge difference. So I'm yes. sure it was. It's a big, it's a big introduction for your future uh, career and your life in music, meeting uh, Yasha Hafiz and playing for him. Right. Yeah. And I, standing I, the challenge of playing the scales for him. Yeah. <laughs> right. Robert, thanks so much. It was an incredible time with you. Very productive, joyful. I, I hope we can meet in person. Perhaps one day you can come and do a live masterclass. But I think it's really was fantastic that you were able, we planned it for several months and then different things happened. I'm glad that you were able to join us. And um, everyone who joined us today, uh, there were many attendees and I'm sure everyone had a fantastic time. So thank you for being here and uh, I hope to see you pleasure. soon. Thank you very much for having me.
It's great to see you again, Dimitri. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Until the next time. Yes. And for everyone who joined us today, uh, thank you for following Dorothy Delay Masterclass series. It was it's it's an incredible project which I initiated this fall, and uh, it gives me lots of pleasure and uh, and great feeling that so many people are following, and we have incredible uh, list of former Miss Delay students, and also we had special guests as uh, it's uh, uh, Pinker Zuckerman. And actually, we're going to have a couple of more fantastic sessions coming uh, this month with uh, Kole Blacher, former Berlin Philharmonic Concertmeister, wow. Joseph Swenson, who actually met uh, in Aspen when we were together in 1990. Wow. Joseph, if you remember, he came and he conducted and played some of the Vivaldi concertos or right. Bach Brandenburg concertos, I think. Right, right, right. So he's going to work with some of his students from Royal uh, Conservatory of Scotland where he teaches in Glasgow, and then we'll have Gil Shaham, also our classmate at Julia uh, at that time. And um, uh, also we have very special event with uh, Itzhak uh, Perelman and Toby Perelman with oh, questions nice. and answers. So this is an unbelievable uh, group of musicians and I'm fortunate to know you and, and to, to have some connection through all these years. And I hope we'll have many, many more life experience we can share together and bring memories of our time at Juliet and to share it with many attendees. Thank you for participating. Thank you for for your attention. And I would like to thank uh, Laurie Harris, who has been generously supporting this series. He's a professor of psychology at MSU. And also my former student, Austin Burkett, who is doing uh, great help with uh, editing some of the videos uh, which you can later see on YouTube and on uh, the violin channel. So until the next time, bye bye everyone. Thank you Robert. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>